What is up YouTube and welcome to this Eternals ending and post credit scenes explained video. While a lot happened in the movie itself, the final 10 or so minutes really did ramp things up exponentially and had some of the most influential possibly post credit scenes we have seen in quite a while. Now much has been made of the quality of this movie becoming one of the first MCU movies to become rotten on Rotten Tomatoes, which is not a good thing for the image of the movie. However, personally, I saw it last night and I really, really enjoyed it and felt like it was one of the most character-driven and thought-provoking bodies of work in the MCU catalogue. We are asked to think what would happen if the Earth were to birth a celestial that would bring more life to the universe. Should the destruction of a civilization and planet end to create life? Is it all justified? I felt that it was a very well-structured, well-blending movie, kind of blending in the present day with the origins of the Eternals and their mission on Earth to defeat the evil, in quotes, deviants. Just like Shang-Chi, the comics history was messed with and really kind of edited incredibly liberally. Something I felt iffy once the twist that the Eternals were sort of kind of robots revealed, but it, to be honest, I thought, eh, okay, it didn't reduce the story whatsoever. Throughout the movie, the Eternals each wrestled with their mission of saving humanity or what they thought would save humanity, leading up to their fracture after the genocide of a civilization by colonizers. Now, Druig wishes to save humanity by mind controlling them, not knowing that sort of kind of what his maker is doing to them whilst everyone goes off their separate ways. Unbeknownst to them, the real reason they are on Earth is to advance humanity in secret so that humanity's energy will birth a new celestial who in turn will create more life. Of course, Ajax and later, of course, himself, Icarus, knew the truth behind their mission. In the comics, the Deviants were created by the Celestials as an experiment on Earth, and also made the Eternals as the Deviants were the sort of kind of failed experiment there. Interestingly, Timu, I probably pronounced that incorrectly, I do apologise, also known as the Dreaming Celestial, did try to defeat Arishim when he wanted to cull the Deviants in the comics. I do think that this movie made the whole Eternals thing a bit more streamlined and a bit more easy to understand because of course is you're not expected to know loads of comic going into this which i think is pretty good in the movies the deviants were weapons gone wrong meant to rid the earth and other planets of predators as so normal sentient beings can emerge thus the eternals were sent to earth to wipe out the deviants so Tiamut the Celestial can emerge. I really did like the idea that, well, the Deviants were hunted by the Eternals and the Deviants didn't technically do anything wrong. I would have, in an ideal world, would have liked more time for the Eternals to kind of digest that idea and uh, kind of work with the Deviants, maybe, but we had a bloated movie, sort of as it is. However, he is stopped after the Eternals formed a Unimind to stop the Celestial. The Unimind in the comics was born from the Eternal Cronus, who turned into a cosmic entity, and the Unimind was discovered when he was reborn. It's a pretty deep cut there. Earth is now free to live its life at the end of the movie. Cersei is taken along with Kingo and Fastos, and Arisham is not happy his creations went against his will, and he will scan all the memories of these Eternals who stayed on Earth to see if Earth was indeed worth saving. Arisham is in charge of the Celestials and deems which planet should be spared. We have seen two actual Celestials so far in the MCU. One, a just a head, that's it, which is the basis of nowhere, and we have the search as well in the backstory of the Infinity Stones. In the original run of the comics, the Eternals made themselves known and fought the Deviants, who had been f actually dormant for a while, just like this movie. This led to the Celestials arriving to pass judgment, except every Eternal formed together to fight off the Celestials, who ruled Earth worth saving in the end. 
Luckily, this is just what Makari and Druig are doing in space with Thena as they go out into the stars to free the other Eternals or find more Eternals to actually stop these Celestials. This will form the basis of the next space-based adventure, which I do believe will tie into the next Guardians movie, especially the fact that, of course, feels like the first time was playing in the first post credit scene, and we do know how Star-Lord loves his rock and roll, his retro rock and roll. However, it's important to note that in the comics, there was a schism between the Eternals, far beyond the start of the Eternals comic way back when, certain Eternals left Earth to arrive on Titan, and thus Thanos was born along with his brother Eros, aka Star Fox, aka Harry Styles. He is who appears on the Domo along with Pip the Troll. Just like the actor who plays him, Eros was a hard partying womanizer, but would start to become serious when Thanos was becoming more and more bloodthirsty in his conquering ambitions. He would help to defeat Thanos along with Iron Man and Marvel. Here, I expect, just like the Earth Eternals, his ancestors became free, and it is important to note that Thanos does look like he does, as he is also a, a, has part of the Deviant gene in him. It's a very interesting one there, and it's going to be a weighty subject to touch. Now, he, of course, knows many ways of possibly the Eternals' origins and how to defeat the Celestials, possibly. Now, why do I think, other than the music, is this going to play into Guardians 3? Well, Pip the Troll is voiced by Patton Oswalt. He was a hard-travelling companion of someone called Adam Warlock. That Adam Warlock was teased at the end of Guardians 2 and will be portrayed by Will Poulter in Guardians 3 in one of the most out-there castings I think I've ever seen. But have you seen him lately? That is a glow-up. He was part of the Infinity Watch in the comics, trying to stop Thanos. However, with Eternals taking heavy liberties with the source material, what happens next is anyone's guess. However, considering the X-Men were involved in a Judgment War, maybe the mutants will debut in this way. However, in the second post credit scene, we see Dane Whitman investigate his family history. It was so cool seeing Richard Madden and Kit Harrington on the screen together. Now, in the comics, he was the Black Knight, the wielder of the Ebony Blade, which was actually name-checked by Sprite on the Domo when Thena was holding up Excalibur. His family lineage was teased in the movie, as he's given a family sigil ring by Cersei early in the movie, and also urged to reconnect with his uncle, which he does, who was the Black Knight too in the comics. The Ebony Blade wielders become bloodthirsty and corrupted, his uncle Nathan Garrett was the Black Knight, but in his dying days asked his nephew Dane to take on the legacy after he was a bit of a naughty boy. We see this in the post credit scene as he tries to go and wield the blade, which is what we see. It calls to him as we have a stark warning that death will come. However, he is asked if he is sure by a voice off screen. Who is that person? Well, this is an interesting one as it was confirmed by the director... <laughs> on new sites, okay? This was confirmed to be Blade, aka Eric Brooks. Yes, the Daywalker Blade himself, played by the MCU here, as I'm sorry if I butch this name, is Maharasha Ali. I'm very sorry, I know I'm gonna get comments on that. I would imagine they are reinventing the Black Knight mythology, just like they did with the Eternals here to make it a bit more mystic. Of course, Dane was an Avenger, and eventually so was Blade, and the pair were also at some point in MI-13, the British intelligence agency, a sort of low-budget shield, because everything in Britain is low-budget for some reason. Shang-Chi also collaborated with this team in MI-6. I did think they would go that way in Shang-Chi's movie, but I can kind of see where this is going. Of course, there is a, another person also heavily involved with MI-13, and that is Captain Britain. So, could we be seeing this going forward, and could Dane Whitman be involved with Blade to take down Dracula in the Blade movie involving MI-13? Maybe? Could be? I don't know. I want to see it, though. Dane Whitman also wielded Excalibur as well in the comics, and overall, the MCU is going in a crazy, wild, 
and pretty unpredictable direction, which I really, really love. I love this movie, and I can understand why people did not like it. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. But let me know all your comments down below. Have a great day. If you enjoyed the video, please do drop a like if you enjoyed it, and subscribe with notifications on if you want more from us. I'll see you soon, and goodbye.